Hi everyone, our next topic today is going to be the active galactic nuclei. So what we're talking about today are how AGN, active galactic nuclei, affect the evolution of galaxies. We really left this alone up to this point uh, in the course and kind of ignored this other kind of vital source of uh, feedback, having studied and focused on stellar populations and their interaction with the ISM. But that was incomplete, and today we're going to talk about why that's so. Now, active galactic nuclei arise from the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. Nearly all galaxies that we've studied show a supermassive black hole in their center. And here, a supermassive black hole has a mass of about 100,000 solar masses or more. This can go all the way up to a billion solar masses uh, for the most massive galaxies. But even at that upper mass end, 1 billion solar masses, these galaxies uh, are unaffected for the large part by the dynamics of that black hole, except really close to the inner uh, workings right there at the center of the uh, uh, galaxy will it affect the dynamics. But overall, the dynamics of a galaxy, as we've discussed last time, is shaped by the interaction of the stars with the overall gravitational potential, which is set by the stars and to a, a degree by the dark matter halo, less so the black hole in the center, except right close to it. However, AGN are really important because they provide a source of feedback. For when matter falls onto these uh, black holes, the process of undergoing accretion, which is when matter is falling into a central object, the process of going through that accretion ends up generating a large amount of energy, which then gets liberated and sort of shot back out into the environment and the galaxy as a whole as a source of a, uh, feedback. Uh, this particular image is the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So this is the Milky Way uh, black hole. And uh, you can see this image, uh, this little circle in the middle is the shadow of the black hole. Since black holes are black, that means they don't emit any light. And what you're seeing is the light that's being wrapped by the effects of gravity and focused around uh, the AGN. This is an image made in radio light. So this is radio from the hot plasma around the black hole with a little shadow right there in the center. Uh, this is more typically what we think of when we think about feedback from active galactic nuclei. This is the Hercules galaxy cluster, and there's a giant elliptical galaxy in the center, uh, which is powering this massive radio jet that stretches across a huge chunk of the cluster, like these are other galaxies in the cluster, and this shows sort of the separation of galaxies relative to the scale of this jet. The image that you see here is a composite of both optical, showing you where the galaxies are, that's the stars and the galaxies, and then the jets actually pop out really brightly in the radio. So this is an image made with a radio interferometer down here at uh, sort of low frequencies. But they've been composited together to really just show the scale and uh, the implied intensity of these jets. Here's another jet uh, that we uh, study quite a bit. This is the, um, the black hole jet in the galaxy M87. Uh, this is an image made with three different radio telescopes looking at that same plasma emission, and it kind of goes down to progressively smaller and smaller scales. The key point for what we are talking about is that the jet really is driven right up close to the central region by the black hole. And so this is a zoom in using a radio telescope, uh, an extended, a very long baseline telescope, and then a world spanning uh, radio telescope that connects up dishes on across all different sides of, or uh, widely separated on the Earth's surface to image uh, this galaxy and produce this uh, uh, image from the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, you'll notice that these images are a little bit stripy. Uh, that stripiness is the directions of the polarization vectors in the radio emission, and that polarization only shows up because of the effects of magnetic fields. That ends up polarizing the emission. And so the lines here are just sort of showing where the magnetic field is. It's quite tangled for the jets farther up, but around the disk of the black hole, or around the emission around the black hole. 
it's a little more organized here. Uh, but this tells us that jet launching is fundamentally linked to the magnetic field. All right, so here's a schematic of what's actually happening in the nuclear region of a galaxy. There's a supermassive black hole right here in the center. That's SMBH is supermassive black hole. Uh, the gas immediately around it uh, is called the accretion disk. The accretion disk is an engine that kind of dissipates angular momentum so that material can actually fall into the uh, disk. But in doing so, it heats up and emits quite brightly. Uh, the top line uh, and the bottom line here, these are the jet. It's polar, uh, powered going out perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the accretion disk and gets sort of ejected out here at relativistic speeds. Uh, around this is a uh, accretion disk is a torus, which is the astronomer's fancy name to stop us from thinking about delicious, delicious donuts. But they are donut shaped and uh, the inner edge of the torus connects into the accretion disk. Uh, the torus puffs up because it's hot gas, but it's not rotationally dominated, so it has uh, sort of some fluff to it as the vertical motions cause it to uh, you know, orbit the black hole, but with lots of uh, turbulence that's kind of puffing it up. Um, and then all these little spots here, uh, these are what are called the broad and narrow line emission clouds. There's a bunch of gas and dust uh, inside the kind of ring of the torus uh, that ends up reflecting light. These are really important for interpreting the spectra of AGN, but are not intrinsically related to the physics of it. They're just more sort of signatures of the environment around the black hole. Now, the reason why we sort of show this and you have radio loud versus radio quiet, quiet and this different angles is that there's a huge number of different AGN types. There's uh, quasars, quasi-stellar objects, BL Lacerda objects, X-ray bright optical, uh, uh, optically normal galaxies or X-bongs. Uh, we have uh, all these different names for them. And the only thing that's, oh, C for type one, C for type two. The key thing about distinguishing them is in part the geometry here. And so that kind of orients us to the geometry. That's not critical for our class. We just want to know that there are different types of AGN and uh, that they are all fundamentally driven by accretion of material onto the central black hole. Now, the other neat thing about the AGN from an observational astrophysics perspective is they are bright across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And this is kind of amazing because you can always see the same objects no matter what telescope you are using to observe with. So on the uh, low energy end, we see the jet tends to light up in the radio and the millimeter wave emission. Uh, the dusty torus around the center is very bright in infrared emission. Uh, the optical is picking out light from the accretion disk and sometimes reflected off of these gas clouds uh, up here and down there. And then finally, the uh, corona of x-rays makes it really hot uh, right around the black hole accretion, which makes these very bright right where the material falls into the black hole. That's the corona, very bright in the x-rays. And then finally, uh, gamma rays can be seen if you're looking sort of down the barrel of the jet. Whatever's powering the jet is actually able to drive really bright gamma rays. So it's really fantastic that we have so many different uh, electromagnetic signatures that we can tie to a single phenomenon. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are many, many different types of uh, AGN, and these are just observational classifications. Uh, we sorted these into type 1s, type 2s, all these other uh, categories observationally before we knew what was going on. And that's, in astrophysics, always a mistake. Uh, so what this is, is every one of these is an AGN engine, just like what I've shown you. Uh, and this is a nice little graph from Padovani uh, et al. 2017, kind of illustrating that there's two main axes for classifying uh, AGN. Uh, on one side, we have how strong the jet is being driven out of it and that's strong jet versus weak jet. And then the thing that we care about is radiatively efficient versus radiatively 
inefficient uh, uh, black holes. And so if they're radiatively efficient, this means that the gas has a very short cooling time compared to the time it takes to in-spiral. So it's able to deposit its energy cool down and really kind of get in line and get into the black hole. Whereas something that's radiatively inefficient carries a high temperature, it doesn't cool very efficiently, and this necessitates much lower accretion rates. And so this gives you all your different types from jetted, Seiferts, and quasars, types one and two, to X-bongs and BLX, all these ridiculous sort of names. There's something like 50 different names for the same object. But we eventually figured it out and kind of are driving towards this nice unified model for what all of these are. So uh, props to the AGN community for kind of getting a coherent picture uh, put together. Um, but for what we care about, we're focused on how these affect galaxy evolution. And the galaxy evolution is affected because of feedback. And that's from the energy liberated from the accretion disk around the black hole. So this is a black hole with an accretion disk around it. You see the jet being sort of uh, shot off here. Um, artist rendition, nobody's taken this picture, just so we're completely clear. This is an image from the NASA website, uh, kind of showing you what the uh, structure of this is. But I want to focus on this engine all around here, where it's a bunch of gas uh, moving around the central black hole all in one direction. And the key thing is, is this gas is undergoing a shear where we have motion, uh, the stuff on the inside closest to the black hole is moving faster and has a higher orbital period than the stuff on the outside. And so it grinds against it and this creates viscosity. And that viscosity can kind of slow down and dissipate energy by heating up the gas. So this gets really bright and it radiates and it it liberates a lot of energy as material falls in farther and farther and farther to the black hole. I want you to know that a black hole is a gravitational sink. It's a huge, deep gravitational potential. And so if something is falling into a black hole through this accretion disk, what's actually happening is it is losing energy. But that energy is conserved and it has to go somewhere. And that's where the idea of an accretion disk generating a lot of energy comes out. And we actually figure out roughly how much energy could be released. Now, uh, brief primer on black hole astrophysics. Uh, the size of an actual black hole is uh, for a non-rotating, non-charged, uh, non-spinning black hole is uh, to, uh, called the short sealed radius. It's two times gravitational constant times the mass of the black hole divided by c squared. And if you plug in point, uh, 10 to the 6, you get a whopping size of about 2 tenths of an astronomical unit. That's it. 2 tenths of an AU. So it's smaller than a solar system. These are very tiny objects astrophysically. Um, it is dominant over the central region in terms of dynamics. So it does haul a lot of material around over a region that is up to a sizable fraction of a parsec is gets dominated. Uh, the sphere of influence for our galaxy's central mass at black hole goes out to a few parsecs if you count like seeing any effects whatsoever. Uh, but really it's only there in a tiny scale. And then remember one parsec and we are 8,000 parsecs from the center of the galaxy. So this is just a tiny distance uh, that is being dynamically influenced by the black hole. So unlike the galaxy, uh, where the mass is distributed throughout it, all of the mass near the central black hole is just the black hole. And so it follows what's called a Keplerian rotation curve or rotation speed. And that's what the central velocity, uh, sorry, circular velocity is, is uh, gm over r. That's how fast an object is moving on a circular orbit. And that accretion just keeps things on circular orbits. Uh, so we can calculate the uh, uh, total energy as the sum of the gravitational plus the potential. We, uh, because we are, um, yeah, we're, we're quick and dirty. We're going to just write down the Newtonian gravitational potential, which is really pretty good until you get quite close to the black hole. And then we're going to add to it the circular velocity, and we get a standard result for uh, gravitational astrophysics around a compact 
uh, uh, or a point mass holds in the sun, holds uh, in black holes, is that the total energy is GMM over 2R, which looks a lot like the Virial theorem. This is uh, equal to the kinetic energy equals one half the total gravitational binding energy. That thing is everywhere, that Virial theorem. So this is the total energy of a particle that's going around the central black hole at a distance of R from the center. So we can ask, how much energy would be liberated if that particle falls from infinity all the way down onto the central black hole? Uh, and so we just calculate that as the difference between R equals infinity and R equals R uh, for the black hole. Uh, so we use the schwarz hill radius. And so at infinity, this term is zero. And uh, then at the black hole, it uh, goes, uh, the final is uh, GMM over R. So that's zero minus a negative uh, GMM over two R. We plug in the short sealed radius and we get, oh, look at all these G's and M's canceling out. We get MC squared over four. That's a big number. Uh, the most, energy you can just get out of mass full stop if you flat out hit it with antimatter and convert it straight into energy is mc squared and so in contrast we are getting one quarter of that out of the process of accretion so that's how much energy is radiated away as it is falling in it has to get rid of that energy to fall into the black hole for if it didn't and it's kept that energy uh, then it would be stuck on a circular orbit with radius r. So it loses this energy and it's got to go somewhere. So we get out a quarter of the mass, rest mass energy of material falling into a black hole uh, under maximal efficiency. But wait, maximal efficiency sounds like an edge case. It's certainly a boundary uh, for what we can do. And there is a limit on how much things can radiate. And we usually consider that in the context of the Eddington luminosity. Uh, so the Eddington luminosity is a derivation for how efficient uh, this uh, gas, uh, how efficient the accretion energy can be, uh, subject to the requirement that it gets rid of the energy that's liberated through the process of accretion. And we want to calculate essentially how much energy can be coming out uh, from a central engine before it blows away all of the material uh, that is trying to fall onto it. And so the way we think about this is in the context of a hydro, uh, we, we think about a star. or a central massive black hole. We'll go with a star because uh, I can't draw Kawhi face for black holes. Uh, and we imagine that there is a proton out here and an electron. And these protons and electrons, they're in a uh, plasma, but they're held together by the electrostatic force. So uh, the electric static force holds those things together. They can't get too separated. So whatever happens to the proton uh, pulls it into, uh, like gravity pulls it into the center. That uh, happens uh, to the proton. The electron comes along because charge separation dominates everything else in this problem. Then if the electron for some reason gets pushed away or pulled in or something like that, the proton will go with it. So these two uh, particles, even though they're ionized, charge uh, separation is going to pull, uh, the the uh, need to not have charge separation is going to keep this gas together. So the way we uh, calculate what's going to happen is we're going to imagine that our little happy sun here is radiating out and uh, there's a bunch of radiation coming out from the star of radius L and it has mass M. And we're going to say that the star is going to exert a gravitational force that has a magnitude of g m of star mass of whatever it's pulling on. That's going to be the uh, hydrogen. 
because uh, it's pulling on both the proton and the electron and they stay together. And then we're going to divide that by r squared. And this is just the magnitude, so that's the total force. And I'm going to set that equal to uh, the radiation force that the uh, particle feels. And the particle that actually feels the radiation force is the electron. And uh, we haven't derived this, but uh, if you go through probably 208 and 271, you should know that the flux of light, you probably don't, but that's cool. Uh, I'm going to just tell you that the, the force of radiation is the flux of light times the cross-section of the electron uh, divided by C. And so that's the radiative force. And then we know what the flux of light is. It's L is equal to 4 pi r squared. Uh, and then we multiply that by the cross section and the speed of light. Now the uh, speed of light, uh, or sorry, the cross section is called the Thompson cross section, which is the cross section for the interaction of an electron with a proton. A pro, uh, sorry, electron with a photon. A proton also interacts with light, but its interaction is smaller by at least the mass ratio of the proton to the electron, so a factor of 1840. So we really only care about how light interacts with electrons. So what we get here is that the Thomson cross section is uh, from our fine friends in particle physics is 6.25 times 10 to the 29 meters squared. So that's how far, that, that's the same cross-section we would use for dust opacity or for mean free paths or anything like that. For light hitting electrons, that's the value that you use. Okay, so at this point, we just balance these two things. I'm gonna stop hopping back and forth between colors here and just say that GMMH over R squared is equal to L over four pi R squared times sigma T over C. Um, I should note that uh, the distance from the star to our little particle here, that's the R in this scenario. I didn't do that in the setup. I was a terrible physicist, um, but I still have three strikes left on my card. Okay, uh, so we can go ahead and solve for what is the luminosity that is so bright that it will dominate uh, this equation. Uh, so we can basically say r squared and solve for L, and we get that uh, 4 pi g m h uh, c over sigma t is L, and this is called the Eddington luminosity. And essentially, if the luminosity is higher than the Eddington luminosity, this ends up driving the uh, force of radiation against the electron really hard, and it drags this whole hydrogen atom outward. Uh, and so that dominates it. Uh, if it is under the Eddington luminosity, gravity can still dominate and pull it inward. This is just the equality, the case where those two forces are balanced. And what's neat about this is notice I did this on the slide, but we canceled out the R squared on both sides. There is no radial dependence to this. The Eddington luminosity is as effective uh, far away as it is close to uh, an object. So uh, the Eddington luminosity has a form, uh, I can non-dimensionalize it, that L over L sun is equal to 3.29 times 10 to the 4 m over m sun. It just scales linearly uh, like that. And this shows that it has to be, you know, 30,000 times brighter than the sun for a solar mass object. Or if we stick in a million uh, solar masses here, that's, you know, 32 billion solar luminosities, which sounds like a lot, but an AGN can easily do that because accretion is so efficient at liberating energy. Okay, so... Um, now, the active galactic nuclei are pushing, uh, can push out a great deal of energy, but one of the big questions is, how do we feed an AGN? Uh, we can get a lot of energy out if we just dump some matter onto the black hole. And the big problem is, is there's this huge difference in scales from what we've been talking about for the sizes of galaxies, those are thousands of parsecs, down to the size of the central engine. We need to basically dump matter if we get down to uh, uh, ten, one ten thousandth of a parsec or a few hundred AU, then that accretion disk takes over and is able to just dump it into the center. But 
the question of how to move gas into the centers of galaxies and uh, critically to dissipate its angular momentum is largely unknown. Uh, there's a lot of ideas and studies about how you get stuff into the center of the galaxy. And it's why we paid so much attention to the idea of bars. And so this is a barred galaxy and you can see material uh, flowing in along the bar and getting gathered up into this central molecular disk. So these bars are really effective at doing that angular momentum reduction and transport uh, to for push material into the center. This is a JWST image, again in PAH emissions uh, like we looked at with bubbles, but here we see the bar pulled out and this bright nuclear disk uh, with where gas is sort of funneling in and getting sort of digested and dropped down. Uh, remember, even on this scale, the central engine is the size of a pixel or smaller. So uh, that's, you know, a key point there. Now, what is interesting, I'll just give you uh, some emphasis that there's a huge range of scales between the um, disk of a galaxy and the size of the central engine. So we are left with a big question when we make the following observation. That the masses of bulges and the central black hole uh, in uh, AGN or black holes in general are correlated. Uh, and typically if you look at a black hole, uh, you find that it is about 200th the mass of the bulge of the entire galaxy. And that's weird. And that's weird because the size of a bulge is a few kiloparsecs and the size of the central engine is 10 to the minus four uh, parsecs. So there's like six or seven orders of magnitude running around between these two different scales. How could these possibly be connected? Uh, and so this seems to be an indication, a hallmark of feedback being important for shaping the scale of galaxy. And so galaxies and AGN grow together uh, over the course of the universe. And there's, so the figure you see here is an illustration of the idea that we have a correlation between the overall bulge properties and the mass of the central black hole. Uh, this is a correlation that shows the velocity dispersion that you would expect, which is uh, in log. Uh, so this is the velocity dispersion of the bulge of stars in the galaxy. And this is the mass of the central massive black hole uh, running up here. This is a uh, figure that is taken from uh, the review of Martin Navarro et al. 2018, or uh, sorry, a Nature article by Martin Navarro et al. 2018. And uh, so what we see is there's this brilliant correlation between galaxies uh, and black uh, and black holes, uh, properties of galaxies and black holes. And this is what you would expect uh, sigma to the fourth should, under the Virial theorem, track with the um, mass of a bulge of a galaxy. So we can sort of see this correlation and try to understand why does the mass of a black hole correlate to like the log of the velocity dispersion of the stars raised to the fourth power. And here's a little heuristic argument that just kind of makes the point. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, known to be true, uh, but it gives you a sense of the kind of physics that could be involved. So essentially we imagine the idea that a black hole is accreting material at a super, uh, super Eddington limit uh, or at the Eddington limit and it's able to drive material out and as it drives material out farther and farther the Eddington approximation kind of breaks down uh, because it's all for a central black hole but as you go farther and farther out more and more mass of the galaxy is interior to you and so you get a stronger and stronger gravitational force. So we imagine what happens happens on a parcel of gas that's experiencing radiation pressure and is being swept out to the edge of the bulge of a galaxy. And at that point, if it's basically right at the Eddington limit, that's the transition between where it's radiation pressure dominated and where it's gravity dominated, that would be the point where it stops. And so we say, okay, well, the force on a object at that pos uh, position is going to be basically the Eddington luminosity uh, divided by uh, the pressure, uh, the um, uh, force, or divided by the speed of light uh, times the Thomson cross section. That gives us basically a force per unit area over here. And then this is the area that it's being applied to. And so if we work that out, 
that gives us the, uh, uh, basically just use the expression for the NU2 luminosity, where here's the mass of a hydrogen atom. Now that force is going to be balanced against the uh, mass of a uh, galaxy and uh, the mass of the gas that's being pushed out. So this is GMM over R squared here. And so this is the whole gas in the galactic system. And so we set up an equality here uh, and we make the assumption that the gas mass, M gas, is equal to some fraction of the total mass of the galaxy. And that's basically the kind of the equilibrium state. Uh, we further assume that the mass of the galaxy is uh, subject to the virial theorem. And so we end up with, as always, we get three times uh, sigma uh, squared, that's the velocity dispersion squared, times the radius uh, that we're looking at, sigma vr over beta, which is the mass distribution constant, three-fifths for a uniform sphere, uh, g. And so if we plug these in here, uh, we find that this is equal to f times g times mass of the galaxy squared all over r squared is the force. And then if I plug in the virial theorem, I get that this is f times g uh, times m squared, which is going to be 9 sigma v to the fourth r squared over beta squared g squared, which is a whole mess of constants. But if we look at this, we have uh, on one side, we have the sigma v to the fourth, and on the other side of the equality, we have uh, mass of the black hole, and the rest of the things are just constants. So m black hole is proportional to the velocity dispersion to the fourth power, which is QED, what we were expecting. Now, this is just a heuristic argument that sort of shows that what will happen as we kind of go uh, and try to dump matter onto a black hole is it could basically get hyper Eddington and really blow the material off. And it'll be pushed out farther and farther and farther until it reaches the edge of the bulge. It'll be all stirred up by the turbulent feedback from the gas. So it fills out this big volume here. And then at that point, the material stops getting pushed, up, uh, pushed away by radiation, the feedback isn't strong enough, and then that material can kind of settle in and form stars. So it sort of sets a bottleneck that essentially says this is the size uh, to which uh, the bulge can grow given a black hole. For if the black hole is too massive compared to the, um, if it's too massive compared to the size of the bulge, what will happen is it will just blow the material out farther and that bulge will get bigger. Uh, and if the black hole is too small compared to the mass of the bulge, the gas doesn't get pushed out quite as far, and so the bulge doesn't end up growing. So this gives us a sense of how these two could possibly be coupled through the process of feedback. So that gives us uh, a little bit of perspective. And again, from the important parts of gal galactic evolution, we care about AGM because they make feedback. And even though there are X-bongs and BL-LAC objects, which may or may not be a BL-LAC object, uh, and types one and two Sieferts and QSOs and all those things, the only thing that's really important is this. If you put matter on them, they radiate a lot of energy and you get uh, feedback. So. That's what we want to talk about with AGM. Uh, phenomenal things, really important for understanding uh, galaxy evolution, and we'll come back to that in a chapter.